He says, after this manner, pray ye, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Keep going. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You might find yourself in this conference, and maybe you have attended many conferences, blessed be the name of the Lord. But I want you to know the agenda upon my heart. The reason why I do this, the reason why, you know, the Lord put it in my heart, has nothing to do with a conference. We can tab it conference, but it has nothing to do with a conference. My fulfillment in my heart, what will make my heart happy, is that thy kingdom come. Tonight we are privileged to have a man that God has built over the years in the wilderness for the sole purpose of manifesting this kingdom. Please care for them, care for them. Kindly care for them, kindly. A man that God has made travel far and wide. He actually was in Tanzania, finished Tanzania. He flew into Mombasa. After Mombasa, he came into Kenya for the very purpose of the kingdom message. There are many messages outside there. I says, and this gospel of the kingdom. So the gospel has everything to do with what? So anywhere you hear the gospel and you can't trace the kingdom, that message is a lie. It is a doctrine of devils. Tonight we are privileged to have a custodian by the name, coming in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, senior teacher, Apostle Arome. Would you with that Jesus joy help me bring to the altar Apostle Arome Osai. for us to understand that the Bible teaches prosperity but it's not a book of prosperity the Bible teaches success but it's not a book of success the Bible talks about prayer but it's not a book of prayer it is a book of the kingdom it reveals how God administers his kingdom when Jesus rose from the dead he had 40 days to equip his disciples about the business that he wanted to bequeath to them and this is enshrined in the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 and for the 40 day capacity building exercise that Jesus conducted to upgrade his disciples to be able to take on the saddle of responsibility, the emphasis of his capacity building summit was things that pertain to the kingdom of God. It's the book of the kingdom. And that's why you must understand that as powerful as prayer is, there are some things that are superior to prayer. For instance, the will of God is superior to prayer. In fact, the extent to which your prayer is accurate is the degree to which it is inclined to carry the texture of the will of God. Are you there? There are some things that are superior to faith. Because God will not be willing to impart faith in your heart if what you are believing for is not within the context of the will of God. It is a kingdom that God is administering. And the end time church is a church that is adequately educated to be able to function as kingdom operatives. We began the first night by bringing education to us that you cannot even define 
who man is outside of the kingdom of God. He is an entity that is designed by God to operate under the influence of his authority. He is going to maximize his potential when he allows the reign of God within him. You will soon find out that kingdom is not a religion. Maybe when you are filling your forms, you say, okay, what's your religion? Then you say Christianity. Well, it is good for the forms. But as you begin to advance, you begin to see that it is not a religion. It's not a way of worship. It's a way of life. Are you there? So God has come to educate us to know how to function under the authority of his administration. And that's what kingdom come is about. Let us pray. Lord, tonight, as you begin to equip your people in this season of the end time, to bring timely truths to our notice that will make us gain mileage and alignment in your presence, we ask that you grant me utterance to bring your counsel in simple plain language as Jesus would have done if he were physically present teaching us and by all means take all the glory in Jesus mighty name we pray please make welcome someone to your left and to your right say welcome to kingdom come kingdom come kingdom come Hallelujah. We are marching forward. And God has a great intention in mind. I want to give us a simple notice. On Sunday night, which is the last night of this conference, we'll be having a wonder night. It's for signs and wonders and miracles and so just in case you have a relative a friend that is deaf that is blind that is lame that is mad the wonder night will be a night that you can bring them so that they can receive their healing from the lord so we'll focus on miracles we focus on healings on sunday night and i trust god for a full measure of the anointing to be at work on my life on sunday night turn your bible you know we began a discussion yesterday and the discussion we began yesterday was as touching the policy that god conceived in himself about a creature that was pivotal to the extension of his kingdom into the earth and the policy that God sustained in himself is concerning man he conceived a dream to have a creature to make a creature the creature that is created in the image in his image and in his likeness so that that creature will be capable of functioning in delegated authority so that he can exercise dominion over the earth we were attempting to make us understand that we cannot define who man is outside of his purpose under the authority of God hallelujah are you with me all right so I would like us to tonight is a sensitive night and I'm aware that Satan is also aware of it we're going to take a moment of time to pray in the spirit 
whilst we are praying in the spirit it's going to be a bit loud so you may not hear my voice again so whenever you see me do this it means stop praying okay we're going to pray in the spirit um, for a moment of time okay is this a sign that we power has been restored okay Well, we are still going to pray in the spirit. The reason why we are going to pray in the spirit is to ensure that every demonic activity around this location is arrested. Now, I don't want us to miss what God has for us tonight. Can we take a moment and exercise our spirit to the intent that God will gain tonight maximally? That Satan will have no portion of that which is taking place in our midst Satan will by no means glory because God is set to bring us into kingdom realities that will fast track our purpose upon the face of the earth kingdom realities that will pedestal us on platforms of advantage so that we can take full delivery of the grace that God is making available tonight we blot out every intent of the enemy to steal into this moment attempting to frustrate the agenda of God we put asunder and we bring into captivity every manifestation of the flesh every manifestation of demonic activity we enthrone the lord afresh in our midst and we give him the right of way step into this terrain and reign in jesus mighty name stay with me stay with me so god had a conception and the conception that God had was about man and it, it was in the quadrant of the Godhead that this policy of God was revealed because every member of the Godhead had a part to play in the making of man the project is not the creating of man the project is not the formation of man the project is the making of man and each member of the Godhead has a part to play in order for that reality to be actualized. The blueprint about man was unveiled. That man was supposed to be created in the image of God. And that's where we stopped yesterday. There are a few factors that are revealed in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 that happens to be our key scripture for the kingdom come initiative. First of all, man was created in God's image, so we'll need to look at what image is about. Then in subsequent conferences, we'll need to look at what likeness is about. Then in subsequent conferences, we can look at what dominion is about. And the scope of dominion that was bequeathed to man, which is fourfold at four levels. Now, Satan, are you there? Satan doesn't want you to ever maximize the scope of authority that has been assigned and allocated to us in order for us to maximally function as kingdom agents. So we are going to look at that critically when we get those factors that I'm talking about highlighting in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. When we understand them adequately and it will take us a few editions of the Kingdom Come Conference in order to adequately understand all of these critical points when we do then it will be easy for you to understand the bible because the bible just like i told you is a book of the kingdom because what are you there god is revealed as an administrator of an estate and there is a divine order of things there is a way things ought to be if God is the one that is the governor if God is the one that is the government there is a way 
things must be. He will insist that things will be in a certain way. Now, in order for us to understand the divine order, which are critical kingdom matters, the divine order. It's maybe in the seventh edition of Kingdom Come, that's when we can talk about the divine order. Then you discover that the fact that you have a calling and you are doing something thinking that you are fulfilling the calling doesn't mean you are fulfilling the calling. Especially if it's not consistent, if it's not in conformity with the divine order. Our generation happens to be a generation that wants to operate without reference. We are like a balloon without definition but you see if we're going to operate in the kingdom there is an order and I'm going to show you the things that happen when the people of God violate the divine order strange things happen so if we are kingdom people the kingdom man must be understood as to how he relates with other people the kingdom man must be understood as to how he relates with money the kingdom man must be understood as to how he relates with governmental authority. The Bible captures all the dynamics of kingdom people because man is a kingdom agent. So in our delivery yesterday, we began talk, touching on one of the key points of kingdom reality, and that is the privilege that we have to be created in the image of God. We're still on that, and that's what I'm going to be emphasizing throughout this conference. Are we there? Now, so let us start the subject of the image of God. Let's start it from the fundamental before we go into the complex so that you can see the picture that I'm attempting to paint. This is a night I want to teach I seriously want to teach tonight so anything that will distract us let us put it aside and just in case your child becomes so excited in need of ventilation we have uh, other areas in the within the facility that your child will be at liberty to express um, such uh, much needed ventilation that is trapped in, in his or her soul in the name of Jesus okay let's go Turn your Bible with me to the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 1. We want to talk about the image of God. We began yesterday attempting to introduce the subject. I don't know how many of you understood what I was saying yesterday. Did you understand it? Okay, so I'm going to build on it. It will be clearer tonight. And then we'll go a bit deeper. And we'll continue um, in that depth until each and every one of us becomes one with that which God is emphasizing. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, that's the reason why I brought you here. Um, the Bible says, God who at sundry times speak in times past by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now, how many of you, when reading your Bible, had stumbled on some terminologies like the precepts of God, the laws of God, the commandments of God, the word of the Lord? And there's a temptation for you to think that all of those things I just mentioned can be used interchangeably. You are wrong. I want to define a few terminologies to us. But the commandments of God, the testimonies of God, the statutes of God. Are they the same thing? They are the same thing. 
So I came to tell you that they are not the same thing. When we talk about the testimony, the testimony of God, what it means, are you there? What it means is the revelation of God, the revelation of God that is revealed by God himself. When God starts talking about himself, by himself, that is what a testimony of God is. How many of you still remember the book of um, Exodus? When Moses began to inquire of the Lord and to ask the Lord, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. And God said, okay, I'll make an arrangement. It is impossible for you to see my glory the way you are, but I'm going to hide you somewhere. And I'm going to pass before you. Then I will proclaim the name of the Lord. In that encounter that Moses had, God was speaking about himself by himself. Meanwhile, it is possible for you to speak about God on the behalf of God. That was what used to happen before. God, in the past, used to speak through the prophets. But in the last days, it is now a testimony. God is the one that is speaking about his agenda by himself. Is that clear? And I don't have time to take you on that part. I would have shown you the other matters that I raised. Things like the commandments of God. And you will discover that because God is running a kingdom, God will restrain you with commandments, not with suggestions with commandments in fact if god doesn't give you commandments about the use of your finances he doesn't give you commandments about how to relate with people he doesn't give you commandments about how to regulate your life it means he has not chosen you because everyone that god chooses god will give them commandments on how to regulate their affairs that means he has taken his place as the presiding principal over your life. It is in that context that we can understand commandments. And it can trust you to know that besides the Ten Commandments, which is the one you know popularly, he still gave other commandments that are applicable to us. Oh, you are not with me. Okay. Um, okay, help me on the screen. Give me... Uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Let's begin from verse 1. Just keep your eyes on Hebrews. Well, we'll still go back there. Can you help me with Acts chapter 1 verse 1 on the screen, please, so that I can read? Well, as we wait for them, the Bible says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen so part of the proof that you are chosen is that he will give you what commandments we were not told the commandments he gave the apostles that he chose but the bible says that he gave them commandments now now when you begin to work with god and god now decides to choose you for a special assignment in his house he will begin to exercise some regulation over your life by giving you command. If you don't have any commandment about how to use your anointing, you don't have any commandment about how to use money, God has not chosen you. God, this God, he has not chosen you. Because the moment he chooses you, he's going to begin to exercise his government over your life and he'll give you prescriptions. And I can take you all through the New Testament, you are going to see prescriptions. In fact, when he came and said, okay, these are the prescriptions for people that desire to be deacons. It's in your Bible. These are the prescriptions for people that desire to be in the bishopric or eldership. They are prescriptions. Because he will exercise his government 
by giving commandments. This is how I want it done. Because I am the government of this system. Any man that is without com commandment, that is without regulations from God, we need to investigate. We need to investigate his life. Because the more you advance with God, he puts a yoke upon you. Have you heard Jesus say, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon me and do what? And learn of me. You will never know Jesus until you allow the yoke of Jesus to come on you. When the yoke of Jesus comes upon you, then the possibility of learning about Jesus is open to you. When Jesus can restrain you, I hope you know what a yoke does. When Jesus has that handle with you to restrain your life, then you will now learn of him. If you don't have any regulation on your life, excuse me, he has not chosen you. You are still in the pool of people seeking him. You have not come to that point where he's, he, he, he takes you out of the pool and makes you to stand out because of a unique destiny in him that he wants you to accomplish. Are you still with me? Don't say you represent him if you don't know his yoke. Don't say you speak for him if you don't know his commandments. For the Bible says he gave commandments unto his apostles that he had chosen. Like I said, I don't have time to go through all the other aspects of the things I mentioned. But anytime you see the word testimony in the Bible, it's an attempt of God himself to speak about himself. So the Bible says, God who has sundry times and in diverse manners is speak in times past by the prophets. As powerful as the ministry of the prophets are, God is saying that in the last days, I have a better spokesman. And that spokesman is my son. Is that correct? Because in the last days, God wants to bring clarity. He wants to remove every ambiguity. He wants to remove every gray area. So there will be, there will be intensity of illumination. And his people will be able to access him and take advantage of his resources to accomplish his program upon the face of the earth. So the Bible says that in the last days, he will speak by his son. Come with me. This his son, even Jesus Christ, the Bible begins to define him. In the entire scripture, it is only Hebrews chapter 1 that defines who the son of God is. Only Hebrews chapter 1 that defines him. So in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, we, the definition begins. So if you have Hebrews 1, 2. So has in this last day spoken unto us by his son. First definition of his son. He that has been appointed heir of all things. Second definition of his son. By this his son he made the worlds. Are you there? You are not there. But these two definitions is not within the scope of my interest. So I'm not going to explain what those two mean. Are you with me? Go to verse 3. Third definition of his son. This his son is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. So the question now, because I'm talking about image, the image of God, and the Bible says that the son of God is the express image of God's person. So what does it mean when we say Jesus is the express image of God. What does it mean when the Bible calls Jesus the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person?
Nobody wants to help me. Hallelujah. So all through the Old Testament, God was revealed in his acts. And you will know that God revealed himself to Moses. Unfortunately for us, Moses did not tell us so much about the revelation of God that he had contacted. Are you with me? So mostly in the Old Testament, we are going to see the acts of God revealed. But the ways of God, the way God operates, the style, his preferences, and all of those dynamics that he revealed to Moses, not so much of it were disclosed. So if you read the Old Testament, yes, you will know that God has power, God can heal, God can part the sea, God can do miraculous things but you will still not know God it's when we come to the New Testament that the Bible now reveals to us that God had an opportunity to reveal himself in the brightest color and that revelation of God which is the highest revelation of God that was ever put on display for humankind to see is what we have in the person of Jesus. So in Jesus, God was defined. God was no longer abstract. In Jesus, God was no longer a fairy tale. God became concrete. God became revealed. God was disclosed. His preferences were understood. His opinions could be received. Are you with me? So Jesus happens to be the clearest definition of God. And that's what it means when the Bible calls him the brightness of the glory of God. So the glory of God never shined as bright as it shined through the life of Jesus. And just in case you don't know what the glory of God is, is when the spirit of God is given an opportunity to manifest himself without limitation. What you are going to see is something that cannot be reproduced by humanity. It is something that can only be set up by God. In Jesus, God was not obscured. God was uh, manifested in the brightness of his glory. Are you there? In Jesus, the personality of God was captured and his image could be seen through the life of Jesus. So Jesus is the clearest definition of God. You get that? So when we are talking about the image of God, we are talking about the expression of of God so in the vessel of Jesus for the Bible says that in Jesus the Godhead was indwelled bodily so if you have seen Jesus you have seen the Father if you have walked with Jesus you have walked with the Holy Ghost because everything he did was under the influence of the Holy Ghost everything he revealed was what the Father was doing inside of him so in Jesus God had the clearest exposition ever. In Jesus, God had the clearest revelation ever. Once upon a time, a woman was caught in adultery. Are you with me? And you know, the adultery I know takes two partners to commit. But unfortunately that day, it was only the woman that was apprehended and brought to Jesus. And the reason why they brought her to Jesus was because they wanted God's opinion see prior to that time there was no place anybody could go to find god's opinion the only two things god gave uh, uh, the old testament saints were, was the law and the prophets so if you make an inquiry they will go to the law and check if the thing you are asking about is already settled in the law they will tell you the position of the law on the matter are you there if the thing is not in the law they will refer you to the prophet and hopefully the prophet might um, be under the anointing and through the anointing that comes upon the prophet he can give you a few disclosures and all of that if you even ask the prophet detailed questions about the things he prophesied he can't even answer you because those words are not his do you understand that there is a deficiency in the possibility of disclosures that can take place about god but here we are in the last days god gave us jesus and jesus happens to be the brightness of the glory of god so they came to him and said master this woman was caught in the very act of adultery and i was wondering if it was in the very act i was wondering why they did not 
it was easier to apprehend a man well well let us not query the people that wanted clarity they, what they wanted was clarity and uh, <laughs> you could see all the symptoms of the crookedness that was associated with humankind manifested in that desire for clarity but thank god they came to jesus they came to jesus and jesus was writing on the ground waiting for the holy spirit to bring him into the accurate position of the father concerning this matter and jesus said if any of you here has not seen let him cast the first stone you know what jesus was saying the people that are here that want to enforce the perspective of the law we need to check whether you have adequate stature whether you are licensed to be an enforcer of the law that you desperately so want to understand so the first thing jesus established was that the guys that brought the case to him did not have the statutory authority and right to um prosecute judgment on that case so the people that came to understand the perspective of god so that they can become instruments of judgment those people discovered that they fell short of what was required to administer judgment and the only man that was in that picture that had the capacity to administer judgment on the woman happened to be jesus and guess what jesus said to the woman he said woman go he said where are the people that have condemned you she lifted up her head she did not see them say no one even though he had the right and the authority to condemn and to prosecute it's okay even me myself i'm not condemning you however go and do what and sin that's the problem with the grace movement the grace movement will never tell you sin no more the grace movement will tell you you can continue sinning you cannot sin away your eternal life meanwhile you have not checked your bible you have not studied it if you go check your scriptures you will find 80 times in the new testament where the consequences of sin were mentioned 80, 80 zero. if you study the new testament you will find out that it is possible for you to lose your salvation because the bible speaks about the possibility of your name being blotted out of the book of life if you study your bible you will find that the apostle paul says that i beat my body i put it under subjection so that when i preach to others i myself will not become a castaway so you are not immune from becoming a castaway just because you preach to others are you still following me so jesus said go and see no more now if you are a student of the bible and you know the law very well you will discover that the law is not yet satisfied the law is not as satisfied because the requirement of the law for someone that is caught in adultery is that the person must die now jesus was giving her leniency what was the basis upon which jesus gave her leniency are you there about four days from the day jesus acquitted and discharged the woman jesus was going to the cross to pay for the woman's sin now you see in in america what they have is um it's a credit system a credit system so because they run a credit financial system the the cards they give out are credit cards in nigeria we run a debit system you cannot spend the money that is not in your account i don't know what do you run here in in kenya uh, uh, what i just heard now is oh, 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 oh. Let's try again. What system do you run here in Kenya? Both. both. Yes. Ah. Okay. So in Nigeria, we don't run both. We run debit system. So if you don't have any money in your account, you shouldn't be at the bank. You should be in the farm or somewhere trying to make yourself useful. Are you there? So whether or not you have a debit card or a credit card, if you have a credit card, it means you can you can buy something now and you pay later if you have a debit card you have the money available 
and you pay now. Do you realize that if you have a debit card or a credit card, the quality of what you buy is the same? Did you get that? Okay, so Jesus gave the woman forgiveness because Jesus was operating a credit card system. So he, 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 he gave her forgiveness because he was going to the cross to pay later. But the commodity, are you there? The commodity that was given, that was purchased, whether you use debit or credit card, the commodity is what is the same. Do you, do you get that? Okay, stay with me. The people that came to Jesus asking to know the more accurate position of things from his own perspective and for him to shed light on the matter of adultery did not expect that the outcome of their consultation will end in the kind of disgrace that became their portion when they came to consult Jesus. But Jesus was the brightness of the glory of God. He was a, a, the, the, the most accurate definition of God. So when he showed up, he brought a perspective that brought God's mind out. Are you there? And the illumination that came through uh, the participation of Jesus in that discussion was brighter than what the law had to offer. He was the brightness of every time Jesus spoke. And I don't have time to take you through some series of when, when human beings, the Sadducees, brought an intellectual theological question to Jesus, hoping that any answer he gives will rope him and make him in danger of judgment from the current government. And Jesus, I don't want to take you there, but at least you understand what I'm saying now. When we are talking about the image of God, we are talking about the revelation of God, the disclosure of God, the manifestation of God in his brightest colors came through Jesus Christ. Are you there? So stay with me. Second scripture. I have seven scriptures for you tonight. Second scripture is in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 7 to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 7 to verse 10. If you are a lover of the Bible, stay with me. Because this is a fundamental doctrine that I'm hoping to be able to establish tonight. And what I am doing is a theoretical aspect. The moment I'm through with the theoretical aspect, I will show you the practical aspect of the same doctrine I'm trying to establish. Because the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not in words. The utensil that is used to illustrate kingdom things is power. If it is absent in your service delivery, it means your service delivery falls short of what it takes to adequately illustrate the realm of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What this scripture is saying is that if by any means you are going to serve God, if your objective is that you want to serve God, you cannot serve God except God gives you a gift. You see, there's an economy of gifts. There's an economy of gifts in the New Testament. And you will find out that the New Testament has a very wide spectrum of spiritual gifts that God makes available in order to make us competent to be able to bring him such service that he can accept. Are you there? For instance, I hope you know the Holy Spirit in us today is a gift. I hope you know that righteousness is a gift. For the Bible speaks about there that have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. It is the gift of righteousness that gives us the impetus, it gives us the boldness to be able to stand before God without condemnation and without inferiority. It is on the basis of the gift of righteousness that we find the platform 
to be able to engage God in prayer. You must have a standing before God before you can advance into intimacy with God. And God is aware of the fact that you were totally incapacitated on such matters. So he made an economy of gifts available that will enhance us and make it possible for us to be able to serve his will. So the Bible says that unto every one of us within his body, he has given grace and the grace that is at work within us is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So for instance, the grace at work in my life in keeping with my calling as an apostle is different from the grace that is at work in your life in keeping with your own calling as a pastor. As much as you may admire the way I operate, you cannot operate that way because you have not been given that gift. So the grace that we have available to us is consistent with the measure of the gift of Christ that is operational in our lives. You will find out that subsequently in this scripture, you find the apostle now saying to, he gave some, not all, he gave some to be apostles. And he gave some to be, are you following? Are you following that scripture? Okay, but that's not where I'm going anyway. Next verse. He said, wherefore, he said, you know, you know the, meaning of, the meaning of wherefore? He said, because of this, because God has made available to us grace that is according to the measure of the gift of Christ, because of that investment, because of the spiritual capital that he has made available unto us, that's why he has said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Stop. 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 Jesus, according to this scripture, Jesus did not give any gift before he went to the cross. Jesus did not give gifts when he was on the cross. Jesus did not give gifts when he rose from the dead. Jesus waited and ascended into heaven first and he gave those gifts from heaven. This is what the scripture is saying. Are you there? The question is why? When he rose from the dead, he would have just called, say, Peter, you come, you take this. This is the gift of apostleship. The capacity to do miracles. <laughs> why didn't he just give them the gift? He was talking with them. But he waited first, he had to ascend into heaven before he gave them gifts from on high. Who knows why? Meanwhile, that's not where I'm going. I'm just, this is just the passageway to the scripture of interest. So I, I, I don't have any problem if you don't understand why. But stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Are you there? Oh, you're not there, you're not there. Now, you see, normally when I'm teaching and I notice you're not there, what we normally do is we, we reduce the syllabus. The, 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 the content the content of delivery that I intended to give will cut some aspects out so that when you labor in the wilderness for like two years then you will not know you need that revelation then God will look for another way to give you yeah, you know if, if you reject the easy way there is a difficult way of that is if you will ever get it there is a difficult way to access it. They, I ask you a question. I say, why did Jesus, he, he, he was going to die? Because in the case of Moses, when Moses was going to die, that was when he called Israel, and they held a, a, a prophetic ceremony. No, what the, the terminology for that meeting is, is a spiritual ceremony. Because a spiritual ceremony is what makes things go on record in the realm of the spirit. Yeah, it makes things go on record in the realm of the spirit. So he held the spiritual ceremony and began to use his authority as a king to bless the house of Israel. That is before his death. So we're expecting that when Jesus now wants to go to the cross, he will now say, okay, 
You see, there's a blessing. No, I have an arrangement for you. He didn't do that. He went to the cross. He was on the cross. If John was able to make it to the cross area, he didn't release anything on him. In the case of Elijah, Elijah said, if you see me when I'm taken up, as I'm going, the thing will come down. They saw him. He ascended before their presence and nothing dropped. In his own case, he only released gifts when he ascended into heaven. When he was coronated in heaven. It was after his coronation that he now gave gifts. Now, so let me explain why he had to go into heaven first. Are you there with me? Now, the reason, we have not started the lecture. All this talk I'm talking is just to build, build context so that when we begin to journey, you'll be able to make the connections. When Jesus finished his work on the cross, which was what he came to do on earth, was to satisfy the claims of divine justice. The requirement of justice was that in the day that you eat of this food, in dying, ye shall surely die. So if Jesus came as a substitute, the implication of his ministry was that he was going to die in our place. So the ultimate ministry of Jesus was his death on the cross. When he paid that price of death on the cross, because what happened is exchange. What happens is substitution. He was not guilty of the offense for which he was crucified. We were the ones that were guilty. So he gave himself in exchange for us. And there are seven things that the, the spirit realm is capable of. One of them is substitution. That's why witches, when they grow old and they want to die, they can give someone in exchange. Not because the witches are powerful, but because the laws of the spirit realm allows for substitution. So it is a principle and the possibility of substitution that Jesus exploited in the administration of redemption. Are you there? So when Jesus died, Jesus, I hope you know, in order for him to die, the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling council, condemned him to death. And they did not condemn him to death from the Torah. It was not the Torah that condemned Jesus. From Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was their own Bible then. And from the 613 laws in the Torah, there was no one that condemned Jesus. So in order for them to condemn him, they had to fructify a doctrine of necessity, saying that it is better for one man to die than for a whole nation. It was on the strength of that doctrine of necessity that Jesus was sentenced to death by the Sanhedrin. When Jesus came before Pilate, and Pilate is supposed to be an administrator of Roman law, brought him before Pilate, and he stood before Pilate. I was expecting Pilate to use the constitution of Roman law to prove that Jesus was worthy of death and there was nothing in the constitution of Rome that condemned Jesus to death. He used an ancient tradition as a means of exercising judgment and justice. It means that according to the laws of the Sanhedrin, Jesus was innocent. According to the laws of men, which is the law of the greatest kingdom that reigned that time, Jesus was innocent. Are you there? But they ended up condemning him to death all the same. So when Jesus went into the belly of the earth, which is the waiting area for departed spirits, I don't have time to work that out. Heaven, the court of heaven had to sit on the case of Jesus. And the court of heaven saw that the basis upon which he was condemned to death at the two instances was false. So the ruling of heaven concerning Jesus was what we call resurrection resurrection was the manifestation of the ruling heaven had to rule and say the justice must be served and that justice of heaven that was to be served is what was revealed in the resurrection of jesus in resurrection jesus was vindicated that he was innocent all along however he has already paid the price and that price has accumulated as currency in the realm of the spirit. So if you believe in Jesus by faith, that currency that has accumulated in the realm of the spirit 
is the there is a theological word is is imputed to you that's the theological word for it imputation uh, the greek word that is translated impute means it is now logically calculated as righteousness the imputation of the currency that was sustained in the realm of the spirit on the account of the sufferings of jesus when when you can enjoy the value of that currency if you exercise faith in jesus to save your soul so that is what how salvation was born and this is the legal framework that is responsible for the judicial basis of our salvation when jesus finished his cross work he rose from the dead as a sign that he was not allowed in hell he was not allowed in the underworld he was not allowed in the place of the father spirits because of the ruling of the court of heaven are you there he now rose from the dead when he rose from the dead he gave he was only allowed 40 days to intermingle with men and what he used those 40 days to do was to teach them about the kingdom didn't teach prosperity didn't teach he taught what kingdom yeah he, he ascended into heaven and because his sacrifice was accurate it was his blood was placed in the balances of justice ju the beam balance of justice in heaven and it was seen to be weightier than the sin of humankind that is why the prescription of the blood of jesus as a pathway to salvation is valid for all time for all generations and for all men now when jesus got to heaven are you still following me he was given an administrative position and that is what is captured in the book of psalms 110 verse 1 to 3. he was given a an administrative position he was given an office he was given a ministry that office he was given is what we call the christ are you there so the day he was sworn into power as the christ the sign that showed that he was sworn into power was the day of pentecost it was the holy spirit that came down that was peter's explanation for the day of pentecost that this jesus that you crucified in heaven right now acts chapter 2 verse 36 god has made him both lord and what christ did you get that the proof of his coronation was the outpouring of the spirit on the day of pentecost do you get me oh you are not here okay i've caught it let's go back to the bible you are not interested in my you know i discovered that the tanzanians are more hungry than you are jeans cw we have to we are going to review our calendars because i will not be here by next year but what i'm seeing here no no okay you know what when jesus was now coronated as, as the christ in the heavens because peter says this jesus okay go there go there go there to acts chapter 2 therefore let all the house of israel know assuredly that god has made the same jesus whom he crucified both lord and christ so he now sat on his throne as a christ is when he sat there that he now gave gifts from heaven do you get it so go back to ephesians chapter 4 wherefore he said when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men verse 10 is my emphasis verse 10 because the, my emphasis is not about the gifts my emphasis is about the image are you still following verse 10 says he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens it means where jesus is throne is domiciled in heaven is the highest part of heaven in the topography of heaven where his throne is installed is the highest 
point, peak. Just like as we were coming from Mombasa to Nairobi, the pilot now say, well, um, if you look through the left window, you are going to see Mount Kilimanjaro. And when we saw Kilimanjaro, it had protruded through the sky. It, had, it was higher than the sky, just there. My Jesus, that's the greatest sight I've seen in a long, long time. In the topography of heaven, the highest peak of heaven is where the throne of Jesus is domiciled. You know why? I'm asking a question. You know why? Jesus' throne can be anywhere, but the reason why his throne is domiciled in the highest peak of heaven, that he might feel all things. To create a potential difference, so that he will flow into everything that is in the new creation, and that everything in the new creation will reflect him. Listen to me. Listen to me. The spiritual architecture that needs to be put in place to ensure that I reflect Christ has been put in place. That is the extent to which God went to ensure that we, who that are supposed to be the image of Christ now, will be able to reveal him bountifully through our vessel. So if in your life Christ is obscured, if in your life Christ is resisted, if in your life Christ is in prison, is in prison such that it cannot be seen through your life, uh, there are many scriptures that need to be brought to your attention. Because the, the architectural um, 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 structure that needs to be put in place to ensure that there is sufficient gradient for him to flow into your vessel and flow out of your vessel has been put in place if it's not revealed through your vessel there are several things that you have omitted are you there god wants him to feel all things that is in the new creation so he's the substance of the new creation it is his administration that powers the new creation. It is his throne that manipulates everything in the counsel of the will of God. Without his throne, God's purposes will not be accomplished. So he is the highest high. Just, to hear, just in case you hear kings and dominions and powers, there is no one that has a throne that is as exalted as his. And the reason why his throne is pedestaled in the peak and the pinnacle, of heaven is so that he can feel all things so that all things can reveal him in the new creation it's the concept of image he will he will need to you will need to contain him first before you can reflect him you know i told you that when we talk image we are talking about the ability of man to contact god to contain god and to reflect God. I would have taken you to Ephesians chapter 1, but it took me so much time to explain this one to you. That's why we will not go there. It took me too much time. Now, ushers, I want to teach. Eh? So if someone, maybe the anointing comes or somebody, just take the person to a corner. There are many places outlets for ventilation in the facility and it was deliberately built like that to accommodate people that will need to shout before they feel better some others will need to cry before they feel better those are diverse uh, expressions of the weight of glory uh, that comes upon the, the the sons of men but now we are teaching eh? and we need utmost concentration do you see Christ is supposed to feel all things. Everything is supposed to be the content of everything in the new creation. So that the new creation can reflect him as an image. So he created you in the image of God. And the administration that is set up in the heavenlies. The essence of that. 
You are not with me. Okay. Let me give you another scripture. We'll jump the other one I wanted to open. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Verse 29. Still come with me. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. I, I assure you I will pray very well to know if I will come here next year. Uh, because if I go if it's in South Africa I'm teaching them this because of the hunger they will understand and I will not need to talk too much but when I'm explaining too much it means no we are not we are not in a good place and I'm, I, I'm, I'm telling you sincerely we are not in a good place we are not in a good place now this is God's eternal purpose they are, if you want to um, read or study into God's eternal purpose, the framework of what God had in his heart before he began the enterprise of creation. There are two scriptures that you can be referred to. The first scripture, which is a more detailed outline of his eternal purpose, is the book of um, Ephesians chapter number one. And a little support, another scripture that forms a little support to that framework in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1 is what we have in the book of Romans chapter 8. The reason why when God establishes any subject, any context, any truth, any doctrine, he must of necessity use another scripture to say the same thing so that he can satisfy the requirement of witness. Because the Bible says at the mouth of two or three witnesses every matter shall be established in fact in the gospels god had to use four witnesses because the person of jesus is an immortal personality it's not a time-based personality you will miss his essence if only one person talks about him you will miss his essence if only two people talk about him you will miss his essence if only three people talk about him you will miss so he had to gather four witnesses and this these witnesses you might read the accounts you have in the book of matthew you might read the accounts you have in the book of mark you might read the accounts you have in the book of luke and john and say they are similar <laughs> it means your, your your eyes have not yet been revived because in the book of matthew the perspective that matthew sustained about jesus was that he was a king the book of matthew is the book of the kingdom so when we're doing kingdom come all these other scriptures we are doing is to prepare you for the book of Matthew. Because the book of Matthew is the textbook on the administration of the kingdom of God and how it influences the sons of men. And you must have guessed the book of John is the book of life. Because the probe that is in the book of John is the manifestation of the Zoe in the human vessel. That's what we call the mystery of godliness how god was found in human vessel when uh, john in the book of uh, john chapter one was trying to set forth the coordinates of his treatise he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made You see, this man is trying to write a thesis. And the thesis he wanted to write about is about God. The first thing he said about God is that there is a member of the Godhead called the Word. That if you want to know about God, focus on that member called the Word. Are you there? The second thing John says... And I don't want to take you into the Greek. It will make it a little bit complex. And since I'm, I'm very sure that you are not ready for complexities, let me just hold my peace. You are not ready for that. He now went further to say, this personality that is called the Word of God, the Word, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You see, he, he, he attempted to study the personality and he could not study the personality as the personality. He now attempted to study that personality from the perspective of the things he had made 
And even a few weeks, a few months ago, a new species of fish was discovered that have never been known before. So if you want to study God from the perspective of things he has made, you will never end your research. So John now stepped down his research module and said the only way we can study this man is in the life that he carries. In him was life and this life was a light of men. And that light shined in that darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So the book of John is a book of life. It's a study of the Zoe in the human vessel. If you study that book and you study it well, you should find 18 points in the life of Jesus where he manifested some strange things that no human being can reproduce. Those were pointers to the fact that even though he looked like a man, the life that was within him was the life of God. Are you there? So John studied his life. Matthew saw him as a king. Look, that is the blue book of the universal grace of God. Now reveals how that he is the clearest definition of God and he has capacity to save to the uttermost. So in the book of Luke, he's called the son of man. In the book of Matthew, he's called the king. In the book of John, he's called the son of God. And in the book of Mark, he's called the servant of the Lord. So you see, he took four perspectives for us to capture this immortal personality and to trap him down so that his knowledge can be known. God, walking by the principle of witness, must always bring a perspective. He must always bring a support for any truth he establishes somewhere else so that there can be at least two witnesses. Any truth you pick from the Bible that you cannot find another scripture to support, that is not what the Bible means. Are you following? No matter how you believe your position is a literal explanation of that text. If you don't find another scripture that supports that your thinking, that your thinking is not the word of God. Because the Bible is not capable of private interpretation. It's a book that was written by one author, one author but many writers. Many writers so that it will carry the capacity of witness the bible says at the mouth of two or three witnesses every matter shall be established so concerning the eternal purpose this is the second scripture of witness the first scripture is Ephesians chapter 1 and the second scripture is Romans chapter 8 from verse 29 Romans chapter 8 from verse 29 takes us into hallowed antiquity in the studio before God began creation. And that's why the Bible says, for whom he did for no. Now, the era he's trying to describe here is an era that was pre-time, pre-Adamic, pre-angelic, pre-heaven, pre-earth. It is only in the book of Ephesians that we can say the reason why God created us. It is only in the book of Ephesians that we can actually understand the, what God is doing in time. It's only in the book of Ephesians that we can trace and find out the currency the, that God put in place in order to sponsor and to fund the things that he has set up in eternity that he wants to build in time. If you, if you do not, if you cannot see the agenda that is being revealed in the book of Ephesians. Uh, it will be difficult for you to know where God is going because God will first travel into the past before he goes into the future. I know you don't understand that. Let me leave you there. Let me leave you there. The Bible says, for whom he did for no. He did also predestinate. One of the um, fundamental features of that arrangement is that God decided to exercise his authority. He foreknew you. It means that you existed as a seed of eternity. That was what he was trying to tell Jeremiah. 
before I formed thee in the womb, I knew you. Before thou comest forth, I sanctified and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. So his ordination, his separation, his calling pre-existed him. So the question is, how does a man fulfill a destiny that existed before his frame was formed? Since I see you are interested in that one, that's the one I will not tell you. But the one I'm interested in for you to understand, you refuse to. Who's the fool? So that's a lesson for another day. It's a big stuff. It's big stuff. I need to take you through about 12 scriptures to open your eyes. Then we'll walk, in, we'll walk back into eternity. Walk back into the heart of God. Then you will see the way God sees. Let me tell you something. If all you see is what is on the ground, what you see is a lie. Because this matter began way 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 before time began are you there so god what we see there in predestination it means god exercised his will it means he chose you when you had no frame you had no substance he chose you and when he chose you he decided he didn't consult you he decided that it is under the administration of Christ that your destiny can be fulfilled. Amen. Let me tell you the meaning of, of that. If God cannot exercise his authority over your life, then God cannot, and I'm big cannot, fulfill his divine purpose through your life. God will need to put you in a place where he can exercise his authority over your life. And that's why he made you indebted to Jesus because he's the one that paid for your salvation. So that you can be under him. So it's under the administration that Jesus governs that he puts the new creation. So that the throne of Jesus will have the capacity to manipulate you after the counsel of his will. You will not know that you are chosen until you come into Christ. When you come into Christ, you begin to see that there's an administration that knew that you were coming and made provision for your calling, made provision for your supply, made provision for your life. But if you are outside Christ, you will think you are an accident. Because he chose you in him, not outside of him. Are you following me? Ah, now you are coming now. I can see I can see you are beginning to get it. He chose you in him. There is a context within his choosing. There is a context be within his calling. And the context is Christ. Because it is an administration that is put in place to ensure that all the purposes of God are established. Including the purpose of God for your own life. So you will be doing yourself a favor the day you identify this and you begin to yield to the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is the essence of his throne. It's the essence of his throne. When you begin to yield to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit begins to manip manipulate you and to bring you into greater conformity with that which is more ancient than you, which is what God conceived about you before you had form and shape. Only a spirit can make you become that ancient thing. Only a spirit. Are you still following me? Yes. So the Bible says that those he did for no, he, he, he also did predestinate. And what is, the, what is the design that all of us should be conformed? It means we are not. But the spirit of God, his first assignment is to bring us into conformity with the image of his son. That's not how you are. But that is your destiny. And the workings of the Holy Spirit is to this end. That each and every one of us will be conformed.
to that image so that we can have the capacity to reflect him the same way jesus reflected god and was called the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person if we are aligned to god this way nobody will in kenya will ask where is god nobody he will be so visible in your vessel that your neighbors will know that you contain God and it is God that is being expressed through your vessel. It will be so visible. So the Holy Spirit will be working out. So anything that is not of Christ that you are holding on to, like your anger, trust me, the Holy Spirit is so skillful. He knows what to do for you to let go of that anger. One day you will just wake up and in anger you will slap your wife and then she will just die. Then that's when you will remember that your, your wife's father is ex-military. Meanwhile, they came, they've warned you before, they warned you two times, they warned you, warned you, and you did here, and you went, oh, and the slap you gave her that day was not like the other ones, the other ones were higher, but the one, but that small one accomplished something. That is the day you will sit down and pray for her to come back to life. <laughs> and then when God answers your prayer that day, you will when there's an opportunity for you to be angry you yourself will say hey calm down hey. <laughs> what is happening there is conformity there is a prescription there's a pattern <laughs> it's conformity it's conformity now when you give your life to christ everything becomes is sweet and you, your prayers are answered then the holy spirit will now say welcome when he says welcome, he begins the agenda of conformity. He will fight against every other confidence that you have that is not God. If your confidence for which you are hoping to sail through life is your beauty, he is looking at you. Okay. So the obstacle I have now is this beauty I gave this sister. He can even allow the matter to, that you join to have an accident. The only reason for the accident is so that he can touch tamper with the beauty. He will fight everything that is a God in your life. Everything upon which your confidence rests, he will fight it. And the reason why he's fighting is for a positive reason. He wants to bring you in conformity with the image. It means that the ability of Jesus to reflect the Father and to manifest the Father is the standard gauge. Is the standard gauge. So he wants to bring you to that level of the standard gauge. So that you're talking, you are speaking his words. When you smile, his glory can come out of it. When you lay your hands, it is him that will be revealed. You will be swallowed up in the glory of God. Nobody will see you, but they will see him through your face. So the agenda he has in mind is that he wants to bring us into conformity with the image of his son. So you have come now. I see you have come. So let me start teaching. All the scriptures I use is to bring you. I, some of you were in the market under the rain. I wanted to bring you. Now that you are here, let us travel. Now, the extent to which we travel will be determined by what the Holy Spirit wants us to. I've left, I've, me, I've surrendered. Huh? Now that you are here, let me allow him talk through me. Now, come with me, come with me quickly. Come with me. Let's do Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 to 21. Matthew 22, verse 15 to 21. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might enter. Now, prior to this time, it was the Sadducees that came to Jesus. They came to test his depth. They came to te test his wisdom. They came to test his understanding. 
and they came with a puzzle came with a story they said one man went and married a woman then the man now died the younger brother inherited the woman as a wife the younger brother died the third brother inherited the woman as a wife the third brother died fourth brother inherited the woman as a wife the fourth brother died fifth brother inherited the woman as a wife the fifth brother died sixth brother inherited the woman as a wife sixth brother died seven brother inherited the woman as a wife seven brother died then the woman now died this is the sadducees because the sadducees they don't believe in the resurrection so since they saw jesus teaching about resurrection it's okay no problem. we're going to set a puzzle before him and expose his foolishness so they came with this story are you with me yes. stay with me they now say in the resurrection whose wife will the woman be because seven of them had her you know what jesus said are you are you there Jesus said, I, let me use the words of Jesus. I've forgotten the exact words he used. So give me some time. Just um, give me a moment, just a moment, please. Before he started this explanation, he made this. He, ah, he said, You err, not knowing the scriptures and what? You will need to be very deep to understand that statement. It is not only the knowledge of the scriptures that they lacked. So, what brought the power of God into this matter? Okay. That's my assignment to you. He said, You err not knowing the scriptures and the power of God. Oh my God. And then Jesus' answer to the Sadducees was none of the above. That's just a summary. But the place we are reading, which is Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, is the, the Pharisees. The Pharisees now came with their own, with their own philosophies before Jesus, hoping to entangle Jesus. What was the answer to the Sadducees? None of the above. Okay, let's go. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel. These guys did not come spontaneously. They came after strategic sessions of counsel taking. They concocted, they concocted their position, their analysis. It is rooted in deep thinking and strategic thinking. How they might entangle him in his talk. These ones wanted to get Jesus to say something that would be the, his undoing. Next verse. And they sent out unto him, unto their disciples, with the head of Dians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. So initially, they came with, the, they started hailing him. Come and see the way they hail Jesus. They say, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man for thou regardest not the person of men. That was the presentation. So after this kind of salutation, this kind of exhortation, he will relax. He will relax. <laughs> you, you can see that the, the Pharisees are better psychologists than, than the Sadducees. 
Because the Pharisees will play with your emotions. There are two things that will show us who, how matured you are. One is praise. Another one is criticisms. If we see the way you operate when you are criticized, I can tell you your level. If we see the way you operate when somebody hails you, if inst instantly you just begin to do like this, we'll know. <laughs> May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. So they brought that dimension, hoping that they have disarmed Jesus. So now he's at liberty to talk. And the purpose of the talking is to ensnare him. Next verse. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Yes, next verse. He said, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. That's the gift of discernment of spirit. That thing that was in their heart that they did not disclose, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus knew it. He perceived their wickedness and he confronted them with their hypocrisy. He said, why tempt me, ye hypocrites? Just for them to know that I am aware of why you came. Just in case you think that the exhortation, the salutation had gone deep into my soul. Oh, I'm still in order. I'm still in order. It is mischief that has brought you because you are hypocrites. I, I, I'm trying to imagine how the face of the Pharisees were when he, he, he got them first. Because after striking them, they were humbled and then you would think that Jesus would not respond to the question. Next verse. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. Yes. Next verse. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? Because we are still on the subject of image. Whose image is this on this coin? This is the spirit of wisdom already at work here. When the spirit of wisdom comes upon you, even though your enemies are seated, trying to find occasion that they may fight against you, Ooh, when the spirit of wisdom comes upon your life, even your enemies will begin to learn at your feet. Whose image is this on this coin? Whose superscription is this on this coin? Next verse. And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then he said unto them, Render, therefore, unto Caesar that things which are Caesar's. Can you see that the answer he gave them is all of the above? The first answer he gave the Sadducees was what? None of the above. Then the answer here is what? Wait. Don't stop. Don't clap. You will miss it. Do you re realize that in this scripture, image and ownership, image determines ownership. It is the image of Caesar that is on the coin. It means the coin belongs to Caesar. Are you, are you with me? Should I, should I say something? Come with me. Just stay with me. I want to say something. I am in love with every preacher of the Bible that is preaching the Bible with the spirit of truth. I also know the danger that we find expression when a man teaches the Bible without the spirit of truth. It can blot out the light of a generation and cause them to walk in darkness. Part of my calling puts responsibility on me for the body of Christ to unveil the truth. Are you following? Before I can stand before you to preach to you, my life is right. I'm not struggling with secret sin. 
so I can be a vessel that God can pass through to reach you. Listen to me. A time came in the body of Christ where a new technology was introduced. And the name of that te technology was Miracle Money. Stay with me. I'd like us to do an analysis quickly. Who, the money belongs to who? Do you realize that the money doesn't belong to God? So if God gives you miracle money, it means that we need to rob Caesar to fill your bank account. And my God is not a thief. Are you still following? Can we? Can, should I go? Money is not in heaven. So angels cannot bring it to you. Angels brought manna from heaven. Because I can show you from the Bible that that is angels bread. That even when we get to heaven, you'll still be eating. Do you still remember in the book of Luke chapter 24, when Jesus rose from the dead? Jesus with his glorified body, he ate fish. It means that your glorified body is capable of eating. It was manna that they bring from heaven, which is angel's bread. There is no money in heaven. God doesn't know. If God wants to give you a breakthrough, are you there? Yes. What he puts upon you is called favor. Favor was what he put on the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. And then when they asked the Egyptians for anything, the Egyptians went out of their ways. The Egyptians are not good people. But because favor was upon them, they were compelled by favor to do the people of God good. Are you following me? That is not miracle. That is supernatural. Because it involves a man and the anointing. Do you understand that? Yes. Supernatural. That's not a miracle. Don't ever deceive yourself that you can be sitting on, on, without walking, without doing anything, and expecting your bank account to be filled. It's, it's, it's averse to the laws of God. Let nobody make you such a worthless person waiting for the next miracle before you can advance in life. Blessed is the man, the Bible says, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the ways of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scoundrel. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord is God, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall what? That is supernatural. Supernatural. There is a God element in it and there is a man element in it in order for God's will to find expression. So when it comes to money and material things, it is supernatural. It's not a miracle. Do you get it? I wanted you to understand that. I have a responsibility to the body of Christ to bring the perspective of truth when new technologies begin to come into the body of Christ so that you will not be swept off by what has no foundation in the creed of Jehovah. You cannot separate image from ownership. Whose image and whose superscription? It doesn't matter how many tongues a people speak. <laughs> Let money appear. If I ask you people to switch on your phone now, are you following? Some of you would have received an alert. Think about it. Can we do it? Please, let's do it. What's the time? Ah, we are late. I would have asked you, switch on your phone. You will see. Some of us would have received an alert already. And the fact that it's an alert on your phone doesn't mean it's a miracle. So maybe I prayed and I said, okay, switch on your phone. The same alert you would have received if I did not pray is the same alert that came. There is not, it is not a miracle. When it comes to money, it is supernatural, not miracle.
Just get it. Get it now. And let us throw every other thing in the trash can. Are you staying with yes. Image and ownership. Whose image is this? It is the image of Caesar. So it belongs to Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But you notice that you, it is the image of God you carry. That means, by the law of image, I belong to God. I belong to God. Have you ever thought that you are not your own? In order for me to be an accurate image of God, the first understanding I must have is that I belong to God. I was bought with a price. I am not my own. I cannot be my master. I cannot be responsible for the decisions I take. I must allow God to take decisions in my life. If you don't start operating that way, it means you are saying you belong to yourself and you are wrong because it's not your image that you carry. I belong to God. I was in the oil industry in my, in my nation and I was doing very well. I was not a poor man. And when I was supposed to become a manager, God now said, Re resign. Resign. That's when the ownership of God over your life will be tested. If it has not yet been registered that you belong to him, you cannot reflect him. The principle of ownership is critical in kingdom doctrine. If it has not come to you as a revelation that you are not your own, you will see yourself ordering your life by yourself. And the Bible says it is not up to man to direct his steps. Something higher than you must be responsible for the directions that you take. Think about your life, where you are now. The business you are doing. The career you are pursuing. Was it your idea or God's idea? If it's your idea, don't complain because it's your creation. If you're married without God and there are challenges, don't complain. Don't complain. Because if you complain, God will say, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength to be made perfect in your weakness but if god was involved in the decision making process that led to your marrying that person when crisis comes and you call god say help he knows about that relationship he will come and help but for you that did not involve him what he will do for you to help you is that he will give you grace to endure i am you are not following me you are not following me. You, 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 you will like a preacher. You will like a preacher that will come and flatter you. I, I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. My covenant with God is deeper than such a role. It was your idea. So he will make grace available for you to survive it. You will make the grace so abundant so that the stress and the pressure you are going through will not affect your calling. In the midst of it, you still be able to fulfill your calling, but it will never be smooth because it was your idea. I need to tell you the truth the way it is. Who owns you? Who owns you? The reason why it's difficult for people to give is because God does not own you. Because if God owns you, your possession, your property is no longer in doubt who the owner is. I was standing before my car one day and the Lord spoke to me. He said, do you like the car? I said, ah, it's a good car. It's been helping around. He said, give it to that pastor. <laughs> give it. I 
I went back to negotiate with him that, are you aware that I don't have any car as functional as, are you aware of it? He said, give it to the issue of ownership must be resolved. I gave it to the pastor. Few months after that, the pastor was one of the people that was attacking me. I went back to God and said, what, what kind of arrangement is this? You know the arrangement? The arrangement is called ownership. That God, if God owns you, he can ask you to bless your enemies and to do good to them that hate you. Ownership. It's a part that the average Christian will never want to walk. But if the kingdom of God is going to come, the issue of ownership must be resolved. Because we cannot talk about image without talking about ownership. We cannot. We'll be fooling ourselves if we attempt to talk about the image of God without raising the issue of ownership. If he's the one that owns my life, he will determine the use of my body, determine the use of what I have, you will even determine the use of the anointing he makes available to me. I see some people in ministry, before you can see them, you pay consultation fee to come and see them. Meanwhile, the Bible says, freely have we received, freely give. And I notice that in Africa, when somebody comes and he begins to violate the Bible with boldness, that's the person we believe is more anointed. The ones that want to operate in the simplicity of the divine order, we don't respect them. What you did not see Jesus do, that's what you are doing. You come and say, okay, you know, want to set up a club, want to set up an association. So in order for you to be part of the association, you give like 1,500 US dollars so that you can have free access to me. And people will look at you and say, mm, it makes corporate sense, but it doesn't make kingdom sense. Because in the kingdom, Jesus gave you salvation. He cost him his life. He gave you freely to set up a pattern that this is how things are done here and meanwhile the anointing you even claim you have you did nothing to qualify for it in fact it makes you indebted to the christ that gave you the anointing and you are supposed to steward that anointing according to his own prescription so you see people anointed but violating the christ because they don't understand the principle of ownership a man that has not yet come to a point where he understands that he's owned by God, anything you put on him, he will squander it on himself. Anything. Anointing, money. Put fame on him. He will use the fame, squander the fame on self. And the kingdom will make no profit from the investment that has been made on his life. Are we saying kingdom come? Then, we have to settle the first matter to settle is a matter of ownership. Who is your master? I want to stop by reading a scripture. God had a quarrel with Israel. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. He had a quarrel with Israel. He had a quarrel with Israel. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Apart from David and Solomon, these were the greatest kings that ruled in Israel. And I don't have time to tell you about the, the, the feats, the mighty feats of Hezekiah. Kings that brought Israel into great prosperity and the land prospered and our defenses were strong. But the cry of Isaiah was that the prosperity was procured at the expense of their alignment with God. The man was crying out that yes, we are prospering, our GDP is good. But we are broken covenant with God. We are no longer consistent with him. This kind of civilization will not last. This prosperity 
It's a time bomb. It's a bubble. That was what Isaiah was crying. Next verse. What did he say? He said, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For I have spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, but they have rebelled against me. You see, the issue of ownership. Yeah, go to the next verse, and, and I'll stop. He said, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's creep. But Israel doth not know my people do not consider. Say it doesn't take so much intelligence for you to know ownership. If you buy a goat from the market and you tie it around a tree in your compound, if you allow it to go for open grazing, when it's getting dark, the goat will find its way home. It's not, it doesn't require intelligence for you to know ownership. He said, Israel, Israel, just in case you are worried that you don't see God on the streets when you move around Nairobi. The reason is because of this. We like salvation. We like prosperity. We like breakthrough and success. But we'll never talk about the subject of ownership. We see God as someone that has so much and is looking for where to spend. But we don't see that we are supposed to reciprocate with any form of commitment to God. And so the Christianity of our day is described along the lines of compromise, utter compromise. Because anything goes as long as we can speak in tongues over it. Our generation no longer cares about the divine order, the statutes of God, the things that God requires, the things that God insists upon. We just do what is working. You see, it's working. People are gathering. It's working. People are coming. Whether or not the style, the strategy you are using is approved of God or not, is not the matter. Results are coming. We have results. Things are okay. Uh, like Isaiah, I cry. That if your consciousness is in the area of prosperity and results, and you are not concerned about whether you are compliant to the requirements of God, any form of advancement you are experiencing is a bubble. It will not last the test of time. He said, the ox know it. His owner and the ass. His master scream. But Israel, my people, do not know. My people, do not consider. As we shut down the curtain tonight, we want to labor in prayer on the issue of ownership. Whose are you? Whose are you? You will hear people like Elijah say, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand. Whose? Whose? Who is your master? Who is your Adonai? Master. The ones that call the shots. The ones that says what will happen in your life and you tremble and ensure that you comply. If we don't have, if God doesn't have that place in our lives, then he will need to wipe us out and raise our children. We will need to pray in the moment of time. In the moment of time. We want to make a commitment to God here today. That is the reason why for my teaching. I bow to your government. I bow to your will. I make myself available to serve you, to serve your will. That all my days will bring profit to your kingdom. Can you make that commitment to God? And as you are making the commitment, you begin to see the things that are fighting with God for the place of preeminence in your life. You begin to see your boyfriend, you begin to see the rich man that comes to drop money for you. Who has twisted your will twisted your commitment you begin to see strange things and anything you see as you pray this prayer bring that thing down refuse that thing refuse that god we will serve jesus cry to him cry to him make him your king tonight make him your king make him your king that's the objective of tonight at the end of this meeting, we must have one king. 
and as you pray when you find him make him king you are the wisdom before time began you reign forever your name is ever great you are the wisdom before time began you reign forever your name is ever great you are the wisdom before time began oh, 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 oh. Hey. you reign forever your name ever great you are the wisdom before time began my heart is yours my body is yours my worldly goods are yours my intelligence is yours my beauty is yours I submit under the influence of your mighty hand that you will guide me you will lead me you will require out of my hand such things that are pleasing to you that you can say about me like you said about your son Jesus this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased When you find him tonight, make him king. Make him king. before him for the Bible says that we were bought with a price so glorify God in your body Idols. Every 
everything that is standing in the way of the Lord in your life? Are you willing to suffer temporarily so that we will walk the path of the conviction that has been formed in your spirit man? The issue of ownership must be resolved. It must be resolved.
in the name of Jesus. Listen. When you make him your king, when you give him his place in your life, he will no longer be a part of your life, but he will be in the center of your life. When you make him king, you will check with him before you take action. When you make him king, you discover that all the money you have was given to you for stewardship. You are not the owner of it, you are just a steward. When you make him king, then he begins to rule, he begins to reign in your life. And first he will reign in you before he will reign through you. His throne will be authoritative in your heart before your hand can bring him into your family. He will reign in you first before he begins to reign through you. Before your prayers begin to change the territory. He must be your king first. The thing is this, people want him to come into the territory when he's not reigning anywhere in them. Reign in me. Now, say it from, if you mean it, if you don't mean it, keep quiet. If you mean it, and I'm going to show you something, a, pra a quick practical. Huh? To show you what happens when the kingdom of God is exalted. We will see it here today. Reign in me. Reign in me. Reign in me. The moment we exalt him, he will show himself. Reign in me. Every demon that has been masquerading, hiding in your life, the moment you exalt him, those demonic strongholds can no longer take hold. You will see the yokes will break in our midst right here. Reign in me. Demons cannot stand when he is exalted. Witchcraft cannot stand when he is exalted. Satan will become a trivial matter when he is exalted. Our rebellion and disobedience is what has weaponized the enemy. But today, we say rain, rain, rain in me and rain in Kenya. Rain, rain, rain in me and rain in Kenya. listen to me let us have the best quietness we can afford just total quietness total now no no I don't if the person cannot control himself just take the person to a corner 
so that the person can have time to fellowship. We have asked him to reign. Huh? All right, I'm going to pray now. It is easy to dethrone the enemy the moment you ask Jesus to reign. In the next few minutes, you are going to see people that are victims of witchcraft, victims of curses. The, the yoke will just start breaking. In the next, just to show you what happens when he reigns, you will see curses break here. Not because I'm a powerful preacher, just because of the king that we have exalted. Bring that lady, bring her, bring, her, bring the person. So, we will use the next five minutes for deliverance. Because anytime we exalt him, demons tremble. Demons run out. So, we just finish the deliverance. So, anyone, ish, see, he's here. Ushers, just be bringing them, be bringing them to me, be bringing them here. So that we can complete some deliverance. Can you see what is happening? Can you see what is happening? Just because we exalted him. Just because we exalted him. Just because we exalted him. The yokes will begin to break. The spell that has been on your life for a long time will fall off. Liberty will be your portion. All kinds of things will begin to take place. When we exalt him, it becomes clear and Satan falls. Satan is falling already. The witchcraft hold is breaking already. It's breaking already. It's breaking already. It's breaking already. He cannot remain because the king has come to take his place. There's a spirit of insanity that I see in the building. And anyone that that spirit has been haunting in the next 21 seconds you'll be arrested by the Holy Ghost because God is going to take it away from your life. You'll be arrested. 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 Anywhere you are. Because God wants to set you at liberty. When the king is raised, his glory breaks out like a plague. Listen to me. There's somebody in the congregation. The sickness that you've been experiencing has defied medication. The reason is because the sickness is not natural, it's supernatural. You were afflicted with this sickness. Even when you go for tests, they don't see anything in the screening, in the blood tests. Everything comes out clean. But it's a very bitter curse that has been laid upon you. And tonight, Jesus wants to take the curse away. So the hand of Jesus will come upon you in the next 21 seconds. In 21 seconds. In 21 seconds. In 21 seconds. In 21 seconds. So that the yoke that is upon your life can be destroyed. There is a woman in our midst. And this woman, you feel heat sometimes. Very, your womb becomes hot and it makes you restless makes you restless the reason why your womb is hot is because some of your relatives that are into witchcraft took some things from your body your clothes 
and they are right now with the shrine yeah bring that lady that's the person i'm talking about bring her because you will be liberated today the moment the king is exalted the powers of darkness become weak Satan becomes weak because the true light has come every false light will have to bow yes yes there's a deliverance taking place right there right there right there now listen to me if I say this you will not believe if I say this you will not believe there's someone in this congregation your bondage is tied to a certain river because I see the spirits of the river appear before me again and again but like I said whenever we exalt him the powers of darkness are wicked father in the name of Jesus that one whose bondage is tied to the river by touch of the anointing touch that one 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 ushers help me we have a lot of deliverance to do today when you exalt him as king he comes down with his majesty comes down with his glory nothing can challenge his authority he becomes the ruler so when we say thy kingdom come we know how helpless we are if he's not in our midst but if he comes if we exalt him enough if we give him his place and he comes amongst us then we are liberated we are free we are free we are free we are free listen to me finally before we start the deliverance there's somebody here for the past three weeks the spirit of death has been following you from place to place in fact you escaped an accident you escaped an accident recently it was the spirit of death that was trying to conclude the assignment the errand that it was sent to accomplish in your life but anywhere you are standing anywhere you are sitting anywhere you are standing the lord will arrest the spirit of death he will arrest you arrest you arrest you arrest you arrest holy ghost arrest arrest for you were sold for naught, and you shall be bought without money When the king arises, no darkness can survive his presence. See, if not that this young man now are you with me i'm going to give you some power so that you can help me with the deliverance father in the name of jesus i ask that you put some power upon this vessel in the name of jesus in the name of jesus in the name of jesus now listen the demon troubling this lady is sitting upon her stomach lay your hands on her stomach pray in tongues she'll be delivered where are you who is helping me are you helping me are you sure okay so we'll give you some power so that you can help me father release some power on her some power some power some power some power some power some power release it on her now listen this one the demon is on the head put your hand on her head pray in tongues she will recover now where where is the cameraman come
this guy, put your camera on this guy. The person that is in charge of the video mixer, give us this guy. Now, are you seeing this guy? If not that he came to church today, we will be conducting a, a burial by next week. This guy. I know most of you don't know how death looks, looks like. Let me show you how it looks like. I want you to capture how death looks like. Because the spirit of death will come out of him in a moment. So that's, that's how it is. So, so he will live now. Now, ushers, listen to me. Don't get so busy that you cannot hear me. Are you hearing me? Some of these people have what we call a deposit. Can you understand what I'm talking about? Now, when we begin to pray, they will vomit the deposit. It's physical. So get us some containers because some people will vomit now. They will vomit. They will start vomiting. They will begin to vomit. They will begin to vomit. Through the mouth, come out. Through the mouth, come out. They will begin to vomit. Through the mouth, come out. You are late with your container. You are late already. Through the mouth, come out. Come out. Come out. Throw them out. So those are deposits. When the Lord is exalted, demons cannot stand. Through the mouth, come out. If you cannot get a container, put tissue, put tissue, put tissue. Because the deposit must come out. It cannot stand the authority of the Lord. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen, are you listening? The Lord sent me to somebody this night. Three witches have been on your case, attempting to kill you. The battle has been for 12 years. And he sent me to come and help you. Yes, bring the person. Bring her. He sent me to you. Because I come in his name. I come to do his will. I will stand with you tonight. And the power of the witch, the witchcraft will be destroyed three witches but today you shall be delivered isko felamine ke bris babrondo hoski so se esina alabraita kopelati ke schema rasko sai ke bobinate kotelia Sister, come. Come. You will help me. Do you have you ever read your Bible before where it says, Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? That's where this one is. She is in that valley. So you are going to help me to bring her out. 
because the people that trained me in deliverance don't allow me to touch women father give her power give her power so that she can help me give her power give her power more power give her more power more power okay who knows this small lady who knows her she traveled to come here far place to come here yes it was her traveling was not in vain put your hand on her forehead and ask her to come back from beneath the shadow of death say those words don't speak in tongues say what i'm asking you to say come back from beneath the shadow of death say it twice when you have said it twice keep quiet so she's coming now she's coming back now okay remove your hand she has come back can you give me now as much as you want your child to be healed you must know that the lord is in charge if i've not called the case just hold on you block all the road okay when the lord is exalted when the lord if you exalt him in your life he will defeat everything that fights your life when the lord is exalted he will now use you to defeat things of the enemy around you because his kingdom has found a place his government his reign has been established That's what kingdom come is about we are trying to create a stage for the king he's been absent from the church for a long time and we know how to hold services good meetings we know how to play the bass guitar we know how to continue without him but the cry kingdom come is to bring him back among us nobody will ask for god again when he comes because you will see him manifest he will no longer be a fairy tale a distant reality but his presence will be in our place can you see that right if you see that will you know this one is almost gone so almost gone. Yeah, come. Put your hand on his chest and don't say anything. He will come back. Right here, right. And as the river flows, he begins to bring every dead thing to life. It's a life giving river. Oh, let it flow right here, right now. There is someone I'm looking for. And as the river flow, it begins to bring every dead thing to life. It's a life-giving river. Oh, let it flow right here, right now. So the person I'm looking for, you are not too far from me. And by a touch of the anointing, the Holy Ghost will arrest you. You'll be arrested. 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 So I've given it. Oh, let it flow right in right now. As the 
rivers flow It begins to bring every dead thing to life Life giving rain Oh let it flow right here right now All those people I'm looking for there I need to touch them on their forehead so if you can bring them, I'll touch it. To to a life giving all oh, it flow right here. No, 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 Before I take my seat, if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, this is the time to speak in tongues. The heavens are open, the, the angels are ascending and descending. His glory is amidst us. His glory is amidst us. Oh, let it go right here, right now. His glory is amidst us. He begins to bring every day. He is amidst us. The life giving me. Oh, let it go right here. of the grave you see some, someone's someone's garments clothing were taken and put in a grave the Lord will come if, I'm, if what I'm saying is true his hand will touch them his hand will touch the people that I'm talking about Father, from my left hand side to my right hand side, those ones that the grave is calling, the grave is calling, the grave is calling them. Show me by a touch of the anointing. your covenant with the grave Satan loser let your captives
be released be released be released she cannot be dead she cannot be dead so I break the yoke of death that you placed upon her life and I command her come forth come forth in the name of Jesus come forth come forth Comfort. 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 If you are here tonight, you want to pray for your family and ask the Lord every activity of witchcraft that is in my family. Tonight I decree four, 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 four. Four, four, four. <laughs> Fall in the name of Jesus. A great victory is about to be secured for the mercy of the Lord is poured forth upon.